This week on the show, assistant coach Jay Triano drops by to visit with Matt and Chris to discuss the Super Bowl, the recent play of Malik Monk and Bismack Biombo, along with the possibility of getting Cody Zeller back. This is the Hornets.com Coaches Show. Welcome to the Hornets.com Coaches Show. I'm Matt Rachinski, joined by Chris Kroger, and we're going to have a very special guest on this Coaches Show. Other than me, not other, me, other somebody than, else other entirely. Than Chris yeah. Kroger, Jay Triano, assistant coach Jay Triano, is going to be co- joining us on the Coaches Show today, filling in for James Borrego. So I think it's going to be interesting to see what Jay's takes on Yeah, it. my favorite Jay Triano trivia fact is uh, Canadian Football League draft selection, yep. Jay Triano. Okay, we think about him as a basketball player and a coach, but he was so talented. He's a great athlete. He was. serious. That's, yep. Great athlete drafted in the Canadian Football League. That's what he said. He didn't really even enter the draft. It yeah. was just because he was such hey, a great athlete. Hey, we want you. Come said, play for us. Come play for us. Let's do this. Well, I'll tell you what. We've seen some great athletes here at Spectrum mm-hmm. Center as of late. Especially, you were talking to me, Kemba Walker, Malik Monk. They are the highest scoring fourth quarter duo in the NBA right now. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think people maybe would be surprised. We've talked so much about Kemba as one of the leading fourth quarter scorers. He's been near the top in the NBA all season long in, in terms of total points points and points per game in the fourth quarter all year but Malik's quietly been there you know in the last few games the last three in fact here at home in the fourth quarter he's exploded started with the Knicks Mm -hmm. he had 12 points against the Knicks he comes back a few days later he scores 14 points against the Grizzlies then he comes back he has nine points uh, on a back-to-back against the Bulls him and Kemba combined uh, in 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 the win over the Bulls on Saturday for 24 the 37 Mm -hmm. he combined with Marvin on Friday night for 27 out of 30 so it's just kind of wild. But when you look at those two right now, I think we all had visions of what maybe they could be from a scoring potential standpoint. But they're doing it, and they're doing it when, when the game's on the well, line. And we were talking, too. Malik's kind of got that swagger right now. He's got that fourth quarter swagger going. And, and there's a very fine line between swagger mm-hmm. and being immature and maybe overconfident. But right now, he's definitely playing the, his best basketball. Yeah, yeah, and JB talked about it. I think it was after the win Friday night over Memphis. And he used that same word. He said, if you want to call it a swagger mm-hmm. and he does you know you've got to have guys who want the ball in their hands I think that we all have guys on this team that if they were given the opportunity they'd take a shot but it does take a special breed of player that says no give me the chance I need the chance I want the chance I will do this yep. if you give me the opportunity I'm going to make it I'm going to make it happen and Kemba's always been that player Malik is wired that way they're just different types of players and I think now you're starting to see Malik's confidence uh, come back with it and what did coach tell us last week he said I think Malik could be a 40% three-point shooter in this league. That's the other crazy part is Malik's shooting numbers are starting to climb, but he's nowhere near 40% right now. Imagine if he starts to add the efficiency level to his game. So I, it's been impressive to watch. And I think the biggest thing with Malik, and just do the eye test with him, his change of pace has really started to evolve. And you're starting to see a confidence in terms of the game slowing down around him. And I think that always speaks to a guy that's starting to understand not only how the game is played, but how he fits into the larger picture of that. Yeah, and the high of his definitely been alive these last few games especially in these fourth quarters you mentioned three straight games of massive comebacks mm-hmm. in the or massive runs that yep. in essence led to victories for this team when you're looking at it and, and seeing how exciting this place is in the fourth quarter right now what is this magic touch this team has in the fourth quarter right well now? I, I think when you go back to the last couple of years right we, we saw a lot of people uh, and rightfully so pay attention to the Hornets numbers in terms of win-loss record in close games and games decided by five points or less or one possession games or how do the Hornets fare in crunch time you know two years ago they were one of the best uh, offenses in the or bo- best defenses in the NBA in crunch time with the score within five five to go mm-hmm. they're one of the bottom five defenses well last year they were top five in defense they were bottom five in offense so they've just been careening from one end of the of the extreme to the other this year I think what you're seeing is a team learn how to win these games and everybody wants to snap your finger and make it happen overnight it doesn't work that way you got to go through some of those situations to understand all right here's how the game is played here's how we need to respond and really I think you go back to some of those wins in November right and December Kemba and Tony Mm -hmm. finishing off games now you're starting to see other guys step up and do that and I I always think numbers are interesting and I'm a stats guy but you can make stats say a lot of things and I think the one possession stat to me tells me you didn't do your job beforehand right you didn't do your job to push a game away when you could have when you had the opportunity to and to your point you think about these big runs against the Knicks 
six, the Grizzlies and the Bulls. The Hornets did those runs uh, right around the five, six, seven minute mark. And so they didn't necessarily have to trigger those clutch situations because they, they handled their business beforehand. And you mentioned Tony Parker too. Tony Parker on an absolutely amazing role right now in terms of what he's doing and what he's averaging. Just kind of talk to me about those stats you were throwing. Well, I, right? I told you, I said, you know, Tony's been really valuable to this team. And you said, of course he has. Chris, I know that. <laughs> I said, well, did you know we're 0 7 when Tony hasn't yeah. played in a game? And that's wild. All, all those have been on the road. Some of those have been on back to back. So that kind of explains it. But four of those seven losses have been by one possession or less. And that's where I think you think about the value of Tony Parker. If Tony was in that game, could he have helped the Hornets get a bucket or get a stop to be the deciding score? And I think the answer yeah. to that is yes. And so you look at what Tony's meant. He's been incredible to this team. I think he's just got such a calming influence, not only in the locker room, but on the floor. And he's been in those situations so many times. And the most ridiculous part of this is Friday against Memphis, once again, where he's logged over the last seven games, he's been 13 points or more, five out of the last seven games. He just, you just expect him to get to double digit scoring now. He had on the season his fourth 15 point, mm -hmm. seven assist performance off the bench. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Seven assists off the bench That's is hard to do. That speaks to his, his versatility and his playmaking. But I, I, I was wondering, how many of those performances have there been in Hornets history? Well, over the last four years, there have been four combined. Total. Total. One each season over the last four years. And Tony's had four this season already. And if you're wondering, the franchise record for the most 15-point, seven assist performances off the bench for a career in Hornets history, the answer is five. Career. Career. Career in Hornets Tony's got four this year. One game away from it. Del Curry. That record, by the way. That one's probably going to fall, too. I'm sorry, D.C., but all your records were meant to be broken. Tony might steal that one. All right. We're going to see another one hopefully fall. Hey, could be tonight against the Clippers. Clippers. We'll see what happens. We'll be right back with assistant coach Jay Triano on the Hornets Coaches Show. Hey, Hugo, before we do this job swap, can you show me how this half-court shot thing goes? I'm, a, you know, I'm not the most experienced with basketball. <laughs> yeah? Okay, great, great, okay. All right, so I, okay, bend my knees. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, arms up. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm glad I didn't ask you to show me how to dunk. Uh, how do I get down? Welcome back to the Hornets.com Coaches Show. I'm Matt Ruchinski. We're being joined now by assistant coach Jay Triano stepping in for Coach Borrego this, this week on the Coaches Show. We're glad to have you. Nice to be here. Thank First you. off, Coach, uh, we were just talking a little Super Bowl. Let's yeah. get your Super Bowl take. We know that that was well, just a couple days ago. I'll just say well, this is the first time ever that maybe the Grey Cup was more interesting than the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you know what? I think everybody's down on the Super Bowl and just because it was a low-scoring thing. But I think as a coach, you look at these games, Games and you go the strategy, mm -hmm. uh, the field positioning. We, we talked about the punters and how effective uh, they were. Uh, I think that you know you look at the game in a different way. And as a coach, you, all your, your goal is to win the game. It's not to make it look pretty for everybody. It's not to score 50 points or 40 points or, or you know you know defensively. It's a sound game. You know what they're going to do. And you know some people are saying two weeks is too long to prepare. Like you know you know what everything yeah. that they're going to do. And, yeah. uh, it loses the flow, but. Uh, you know, still, you know, when you're competing for the the grand prize, you find a way to win. And that's what uh, New England did. I, I would wonder as a coach, do you watch a game differently like that? Or are you watching the sidelines? I was taken back by Sean McVay, the Rams coach. Uh -huh. You know, all the things that maybe they were so frustrated, right? Wasn't going their way, couldn't get out of, stuck out of the mud. And he's pretty calm, cool, and collected. So yeah. as a coach, do you watch things like that during a game where you think, well, you, you appreciate the way they interact or how they yeah, hold the team I together? Think as a coach, sometimes you, you look that way, but inside, it's probably a different story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you know, you go back. To, you know, they're such a great offense all year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, we go back to the punters. I mean, the punting. They, they, their field position was was tough field position to start almost every drive, and Crazy. that makes it real tough uh, on a on a young quarterback and on a, on a team that's used to having a little bit more space. See, there's our football edition of the <laughs> yeah, coaches. You can do it all. When you got a guy who was drafted in the CFL, you know, yeah, he can right. talk football is, until until the dogs go home, I guess, probably. Yeah. But let's talk a little bit about this Hornets team right now. Now, playing some great basketball, yep. five wins in a row here at Spectrum Center. What is it about this team that's playing so well on its home court right now? I think, you know, I, 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 
the whole season, I think, is we're just starting, we're, we're getting used to each other and getting used to roles and where guys fit and, and what they can do to contribute. And I think you can look at guys like uh, Biz, you know, not in rotation at all early, then in rotation a little bit, and then had, had to start because of the injury. Uh, Malik plays some games, doesn't play some games, and now he's been a constant uh, guy as far as contributing in the fourth quarter for us. Uh, Miles has gone through the, you know, the the rookie, I'm okay some games, I'm not okay other games, and then flashes of brilliance. And I think we're all starting to just understand each other a little bit, and I think guys are starting to feel comfortable with what we're trying to do at both ends of the floor, both offensively and defensively. We've talked to JB a lot about this team coming together chemistry-wise, mm -hmm. too, but there is something to that, right, as a coach, about being connected as a group, yeah. and maybe that long road stretch in January has actually brought this team a little bit more together cohesively. Yeah. I think a lot of times teams look at road trips in a way, you know, when you're at home, you go home to your family. When, you know, you're on the road for a long trip like that, sometimes you have to, you know, hang out a little bit more. And, you know, we started these team dinners a little bit. And, uh, uh, you know, guys, I think at first were like, wow, no, I don't want to do this. And then they go and it's kind of fun and everybody starts talking a little bit. You get to know your teammates a little bit better. And I think that's great for cohesiveness. Uh, and I think we I think we're two and oh after team dinners. So so guys are like, okay. oh, when's the next one? But, <laughs> but it, it, it's a fun thing. And, uh, and you're right. We spend so much time with these guys. You're with the, the same players and staff uh, every single day um, uh, trying to figure out how to win games or travel or do whatever you're doing and um, get to know them as people first because that's who we are. A few weeks ago after that Portland game, that's when JB really came out and said this team needs to have a defensive mindset. Mm -hmm. We really need to have that defensive mentality, yeah. really challenge the players. Mm -hmm. As a coach who's been in the league for years, years mm -hmm. when you see a young head coach like JB doing that how is he doing in terms of challenging these players oh, right he's now? great I mean he's got a, a great demeanor in front of the team and when he talks to them and he's honest which is the number one thing I mean if you if you try to not be truthful or try to scam somebody they're gonna, these guys are smart guys they figured that out and JB's just been honest and truthful and uh, matter of fact and to the point and held guys accountable um, so I mean that's all you can do as a coach and he's handled it well and I think we we all kind of recognize, you know, that if you're going to be, you know, I think we recognize real early, we're going to be able to score and we're going to find ways to score, but uh, we can't go out there and try to outscore everybody every night. And, and the one thing that can be consistent is your effort and the consistency with which you play defense. So um, he's been, we've tried to hold guys more accountable at that end and I think we've been better defensively and sure enough when you play good defense it leads to good offense uh, just because of your ability to run and get stops and play in transition. To that point, you know, we talk about Kemba as the captain of this team. Marvin's the other captain mm -hmm. and I think there's been a tie to maybe this team finding that defensive presence and urgency and identity with Marvin and Marvin yeah. on any given night is defending some of the toughest covers in the NBA. Yeah. He can go big, he can go small and then what he does from an offensive standpoint but even the other night, you know, diving on the floor for loose balls, he just brings yeah. an identity I think to your team. Ab absolutely. And I think that's the, you know, his leadership role. I mean, he's going to play. He's going to he's going to make shots, and you know, he kind of epitomizes what I just said. Uh, he's going to he's going to score offensively. He's going to spread the floor, and he's going to make shots. He's going to make the right play. But when he plays defense the way he has, it's uh, it's been great. And I also think you know that Nick is kind of accepted that role. I know Nick gets bashed a lot and everything, but Nick guards the toughest guy. He he whether it's a one, two, or three, and you know if he gets switched on to somebody, you're comfortable. Uh, even as a big guy and I think you know he's done a real good job of taking guys out of games for us uh, you know the other night you know we wanted him on Levine and that's a tough matchup and I thought he did it I thought he did a pretty good job just not letting him ever get comfortable and um, he's got a tough matchup every night and he knows it and he accepts mm -hmm. it and I, and I think that's 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 been one of the things too so when you get the two guys that have been maybe around the, long, the league the longest uh, in Nick and Marvin uh, leading by example it sends a real good message as far as the culture we're trying to build with guys like Malik and Miles and the young players on this team. You know, over the course of the last three home games, this is what's happened in the fourth quarter. 17-1 to one run to yeah. pull out a win. 17-3 yeah. run to pull out a win. 20-4 mm -hmm. to four run to pull out. All fourth quarter runs yeah. have led to victories. 
fans will look at that and go, offensively, this team must have just went off. What about defensively yeah. over the course of the stretch? How good is this team playing in the fourth quarter? Yeah, I, I think that's the key. The, those, I, the, the, to me, the most impressive numbers are the second numbers that you were saying, like you know, twenty to four mm-hmm. uh, run. The four is the key. I mean, how do you how do you hold the team mm-hmm. off the scoreboard that long? But um, I think you know we're switching a little bit more. Um, we're we're keeping guys in front. We're playing a little bit smaller sometimes so that we can switch. Uh, we're stopping guys from getting into the paint. We've worn teams down uh, throughout the course of the game. So uh, I think you know we're, we're we're pleased with our defense. And, and again, like I said, as soon as we get like two or three stops, there's been games where we've been we've been cold, and then two or three stops, we feel good about our defense. It just changes the way you carry your body, you carry your body a little bit differently, you shoot the ball a little bit more confidently. And uh, I, I think we've been a much better offensive team in the fourth quarter lately as well. You and I've had conversations sometimes about stats. You can make numbers say some whatever you want sometimes. And I think one of the stats that this team has uh, been linked to over the last few years, the all the tight losses and one yeah. possession games, but to me when you talk about these runs those runs were about six seven minutes out in the game so yeah. those are games that if you let a team linger you would have triggered those clutch situations right. those one possession games but I think that's what maybe speaks to this team's improvement in late game situations is you don't even let it get to that point you guys find a way to yeah. finish it early. Uh, we're, we're, we're very cognizant of that and then uh, in the late game and stuff like that but I think you know our execution late game has been great and you're, you're right you can call late game the last two minutes oh it's 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 11 or 12 points like it was the other night you know but it, it started at six minutes that was a close game and it was mm-hmm. back and forth the whole game so that was a close game with six minutes to go it was a close game with five minutes to go and our execution and our defense uh, won it for us so I think we're becoming a lot more comfortable with each other and like I said and a lot more confident you mentioned the young guys and the growth you've seen them make over the course of the last month or so mm-hmm. Malik the stretch that he's been on in fourth quarters especially yeah. can you just talk about Malik and what you've seen from him and how he's really kind of started to take over offense when yeah. has a chance. Well, I think Malik is one of a, a, a few players on our team that has the ability to, you can just give him the ball, we don't need a play, and his athleticism and talent, is he can beat you. And, you know, a lot of teams don't, don't have any of those guys, and some teams have two, three or four of them, but Malik's in that role. And I think what's, what he's done is he's really being coachable by, you know, Coach Bray has done a great job with him, like holding him accountable when he doesn't do the right thing. And sometimes that has meant um, you don't play and you're going to sit on the bench. Uh, and I think that has been, that's the toughest lesson for a, for a young player is you want to play. So I think both he and Miles have, have, have said, okay, I need to stay on the floor, so I need to do this at the defensive end. Then I can show what I can do at the offensive end. And, you know, Malik is, uh, I think, at times when he's when he when he maybe was gifted too many minutes early in the year he felt like oh i have to make something happen and it was a rush and it was a panic and i think he's he's slowed the game down now he's he's getting into the he makes great decisions passing the basketball he makes great decisions scoring so uh, we've seen him we've seen him be a guy that's really kind of ignited us and i think a lot of it has to do with him being on the floor and the fact that he's gained the trust of the coaching staff to be on the floor in the fourth quarter where maybe that wasn't the case earlier well we opened the month of january without cody zeller so we knew that was going to be tough 10 of 14 on the road Jay- be said, I want to be a better team. I think this can make us a better mm-hmm. team when we look back on the end of it and we get them back. Yeah. Biz and Billy, I think, have combined to form that hole, and I think it, it has made you a better team, but what's it going to mean to have Cody back over these next few games, hopefully? It's going to just mean depth for us, and, and, and you know, we're going to have to work with him and have him get his feel back, but uh, you know, he's been, he, he, he says he's in better shape now than he was, and probably healthier, you know, knee issue and, and stuff like that, that, you know, he's going to be, he's in a, he's in a good spot uh, to come back, but I think we've we've because of the situation. I think I think we were 500 the the game that he and we're still 500, so mm-hmm. we we're able to tread water. And I think what it's done is it's added depth to our lineup. Uh, now Biz and a guy maybe who probably wasn't in rotation at the time is contributing, and he's been very good at the defensive end, especially for us. So and now we've got an extra weapon, and uh, Cody's going to fit right in. And I know you know his assist. Uh, his screen assist is one, like one of the highest in the NBA, so I'm sure that K Walk is going to enjoy having him back as well. He just sets great screens, and he knows how to he knows how to get guys open as well as, as play the game, and he thinks the game as much as he plays it. So uh, it's going to help our basketball IQ with him back as well. We mentioned one of the hottest teams in the league on their home court right now, right here in Charlotte. Yeah. Got to close this home stand out against yeah. the Clippers. What's going to take to stop the Clippers? 
Well, they're, they're they play hard. They play, they play. They're physical and they play hard. And that's a, you know, I would say maybe when we play teams like that, that those are the toughest matchups for us. You know, so we've got to be, uh, we've got to be able to accept their physicality and be aggressive and not play on our heels when when we get hit. Uh, and I think we've we've gotten better at that, and that'll be the key tomorrow night. It's just how 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 can we keep you know pressure on them? Get to get into the paint, share the basketball, or, or finish strong, and, and and conversely at the other end of the floor, stop them from doing the same thing. Bring the defensive intensity from Super Bowl 53. That's the key. Yeah, right? yeah, that's the go. key. Yeah, we Except, that's how we get yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much for joining us, Coach. My pleasure. For assistant coach Jay Triano, we'll be right back on the Hornets.com Coaches Show. Either we win it or there's overtime. Lamb's going to have to fire. Got it! Kemba bounces into a three. Enough legs to get it through. Bus City. It started 30 years ago. You're the best fans in, the best fans now. Let's have a great year. Welcome back to the Hornets.com Coaches Show. Great to be joined by Coach Jay Triano. It was a little bit different for the Coaches Show. It worked out well, though. I don't play favorites because I'd get me in trouble with the coaching staff, but I'm a big fan of Jay Triano. He's a man of the world. You, if you get a few minutes to just talk to him, if you're a fan, yes, you get to come out yes, to a game. Well see the, yeah, he's just got stories for days, and he's just a man. He's a man of the world. He's got a lot of great philosophies about him. All right, well, let's see what your philosophy is on getting a win tonight against the Los Angeles Clippers. We played them once this season. Mm -hmm. Out in L.A., obviously that Clippers bench is one of their strong suits. Well, first in the NBA in bench scoring, and it makes sense when they've got the number one bench scorer in the NBA and Lou Williams, who I think based off the Spencer Dinwiddie injury, there's still a lot of basketball left to be played. But I say Lou Williams right now by far the front runner to win sixth man of the year in the NBA. He's done it multiple times, so who could be shocked by that? And he, he's just capable of coming in and changing a game. And I think, you know, we talked about Malik earlier. I've always thought Malik Monk, a, a great comparison for him long term in the NBA would be Lou Williams. And what a career that would be if Malik Monk turned into a player like Lou. And that's a testament to how, how good Lou is. And I think the toughest thing, we saw a lot of this in the in the game in L.A. at Staples Center, Lou is really good at, at drawing fouls. Mm -hmm. You know, He's a guy that is really hard to defend and stay in front of. He knows how to bait people into fouling. And so I think that's job number one. Lou's going to score. Mm -hmm. Do not give him easy shots at the free throw line. He's going to hit buckets. He's definitely going to hit a, a, a lot of the shots at the mid-range. He loves to get to the elbows. But do not send him to the charity stripe with regularity because that'll be costly. And more than anything, be physical. If mm -hmm. you go back to that game, L.A. just took the court and just had this attitude about him. And I, I talked to J.B. before that game. I said, what could you tell me about a Doc Rivers team? And his response was, they just got this attitude. He mm -hmm. said, you know, he's always kind of had this chip on his shoulder, started as a player. It's happened still as a coach. And I think his teams take on that identity. You've got to match that, even at home, because that's how they play every single night. So I think some of the stuff tonight is just the intangible stuff. If you play that way against the Clippers, I think the Hornets are going to be in a really good spot. And by the way, L.A., still dangerous, but since the Hornets saw them last, they're 5-9 and nine mm -hmm. in the last 14. Hornets, meanwhile, have won 7-10. You know, you're talking about that Doc Rivers-type team. Does 
does anybody embody that more than a guy like Montrez Harrell? Unbelievable. Who we saw out last time just kind of own us inside. And we might see Cody back mm -hmm. tonight, right? It's, it's a possibility. We, yeah. we'll, we'll wait and see if whether this is the night. If not, it's going to be in the next few games. We're going to see Cody back from this hand injury. But I do think, as we talk to Coach, this team's much better suited now to, to play whatever team shows up on any given night with their front court possibilities. Mm -hmm. And now a guy like Biz, and I'll give you this stat on Biz, he is fourth in defensive rating on our team. So when he's on the court, we have, a, we have, we have the fourth best defense, or excuse me, second best defense, but we're fourth in offense. So we're playing organized. Biz on the court. Yeah, with Biz on the court. So we're organized with Biz on the court from an offensive standpoint too. So I think Biz could be an X factor tonight. And look, we saw some of his rim protection late in the game against Memphis. Mm -hmm. You see him out on the perimeter slapping his hands. He, was, he said, come on, bring, give me, bring the game to me a little bit. So I think that's the attitude. And Harold's a beast. Yeah. He's physical, but I, I think the Hornets might have some uh, some bodies to throw his and way tonight. We talk about that swagger of Monk. I, I think Biz can have that swagger sometimes too, and he's not afraid to challenge a guy at all. Yeah. Well, we've talked about where we're at right now. We've got some great games coming up, obviously. We're about to head out on the road after this one. Huge road trip for mm -hmm. us. Broken up four games before the All-Star break, but when we get back from the All-Star break, there's four games that'll be right yeah. here at Spectrum Center as this team looks to continue to build on their home record. Big stretch, and you look at where the Hornets are right now. They're sitting just a game back at the sixth spot in the Eastern Conference. They're sitting three and a half games clear of the cut line in the playoffs right now. Hornets in seventh in the East, and they're in a great position. They already own tiebreakers with uh, with Detroit. Uh, they're split 2-0 with uh, or up 2-0 on Miami, mm -hmm. so Miami can't own a tiebreaker. Yep. Up 2-0 on Orlando right now as well. So you could take the season series from the Magic uh, coming up on this final game of the road trip like you're talking about before the All-Star break. So Hornets are in a great position, and as Coach was telling us last week, the, this week and a half stretch right here before the All-Star break, this is a mental stretch. This team has got to be locked in, and I think when you look at how other teams around them are playing, you see Detroit backsliding a little bit, Orlando, Brooklyn keeps dealing with more injury issues, Indiana obviously with the loss of Victor Oladipo. Hornets don't feel sorry for anybody, so I think this is an opportunity maybe to gain some ground before the All-Star break. And this team's got to be feeling good about itself, so maybe they're not looking ahead as much as some other teams yeah. who want the break are looking ahead. No, I agree, and it's funny how this works sometimes. I think if you're a team, it depends on, like you said, where your lot is in life mm -hmm. in the NBA schedule. Some teams are dying to get to the All-Star break. You can feel them coming up gasping for air, saying, just get me there. We need some rest. We need to get healthy. And I think other teams are saying, no, let's wait another month. We're playing great basketball. We don't want to, we don't want a week off right now. And if you're into the, you know, kind of the stars aligning sort of thing, the Hornets, back in 2015-16, when they won 48 games, mm -hmm. they got to 500 at 26 and 26. They never looked back the rest of the way. And of course, that year, the Hornets had the third best record in the NBA after the All-Star break, best in the Eastern Conference. So I don't know. Maybe you're into this sort of thing. The Hornets, yeah, you know, 26 and 26. They've hit 500 again since, since for the first time since 18 and 18. Yeah, maybe the Hornets hit a hot streak here and, and, and really turn on the Jets. All right, best way to do that would be to get a win tonight against the Los Angeles Clippers, move over that 500 mark. For Chris Kroger, for assistant coach Jay Triano, I'm Matt Rochinski with Hornets.com.